Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Donna, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Donna. And I really want to thank you for having me. I want to thank Lois and the committee. You know how to do conventions right. This has been an absolutely fabulous time for me. (laughs) They deserve it. They deserve it. And you certainly don't look like a bunch of alcoholics. You look really good. This is kind of, uh, this is a homecoming for me. I do live in Santa Monica, but I'm from Riverside. I grew up in Riverside. My, I graduated, let's see, grade school was at St. Christopher's Church. All six years that school was open. I'm a graduate of Notre Dame High School. Went to UC Riverside for a little bit. My family all still lives here. And this is a very special night for me because two of my sisters are here. They're not alcoholic. And this is the first time they've been to an AA meeting. So this is, yeah, we're really glad they're here. When I was about six months sober, I told my parents, who live in Riverside, that I was now sober and a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they were a bit surprised because all my drinking had been done outside the home. It had been done in Los Angeles. So they thought that if Alcoholics Anonymous would help me, that would be fine. But my mother asked that I not go to meetings in Riverside. Here I am. (laughs) Hi, Mom. (laughs) She's not here. (laughs) She'd love it. She'd love it. But I'll tell you a bit about myself. I got sober seven years ago up in Eureka, California. And that's a small town on the coast of California, about an hour south of Oregon. And my hometown group, my home group where I got sober, was the Myrtle Town Survivors. Yes. And the Myrtle Town Survivors have some very definite ideas about sharing at their meetings. They say, we all know how to drink, and we all know how to use, and we all know how to get drunk. But not all of us know how to get sober, and not all of us know how to stay sober. So when you share at a Myrtle Town Survivor meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, they want to hear recovery. And hopefully that's what I'll do tonight. I will share enough about my story so none of you have to leave here and say, I wonder if she drank. You will know that I earned my seat in Alcoholics Anonymous by the time you leave. If you want the whole nine yards of a drunk log we can go out to coffee, but I don't think it will be necessary. You'll know. But I'd like to spend the bulk of the time talking about what got me sober and what keeps me sober today. Now, the Myrtle Town survivors have some other ideas about sharing. They say if you can't say it in three to five minutes, they personally don't want to hear it. So they would throw up if they knew I was speaking tonight because they don't have speaker meetings in Eureka. You know, they just, it's too small town. If you had a regular speakers meeting in Eureka, you're listening to somebody you've heard all week long. And you don't want to do that. So they aren't used to speakers meeting. But I did get sober. The first account of me and alcohol is when I'm about two years old, there's a family portrait of me, a family picture of me sucking on a bottle of champagne. And that bottle of champagne was given to me by my grandmother, who died an alcoholic. And she thought it was cute, and so she took a picture. And it was kind of a cute picture. Now, you may be saying to yourself, see, we've heard it before. Another dysfunctional alcoholic home. Have we heard this story? But that's not true for me. That was my grandmother who lived back east. I'm the oldest of five kids. I have two parents that are still married. You know, my fiancé, I'm getting married in December. My fiancé is sitting right over there with my sisters. (laughs) My fiancé and I go out dancing with my parents, and they're still the most romantic couple out there. You know, my family's idea of drinking, they knew how to social drink. 
You know, all the seven of us would be around the table for dinner, and they'd bring out a bottle of wine, pour everybody a glass of wine. Half the people drank half of it. Half that bottle of wine went back in the refrigerator at the end of dinner. Nothing we understand, but they call that social drinking. And that's what I grew up with, a lot of social drinking. They know how to do it. I had another example in my family of social drinking. It was my brother. My brother and I used to smoke a little pot out in the orange groves behind our house. And he's two years younger than I am. And he got to be 21. And he graduated from college. He met a woman he wanted to marry. He had a job. They wanted to have kids. And he said, Donna, I've got to cut this out. I'm going to become an adult. And I thought, you know, that thought never crossed my mind. I've got to cut this out. I'm going to be becoming an adult. My idea was responsibilities got in the way of my drinking. If I had to choose between responsibilities and drinking, it was always drinking. But you know, those social drinkers, they choose responsibilities first. And that was the difference between the way I drank and the way my family drank. I grew up in a very loving home. But alcohol did something different to me than the other people. My first drink was when I was a senior in high school, a very late bloomer by today's standards. I was your all-around overachiever. I was student body president, editor of the newspaper, captain of the tennis team, and a straight-A student. And I didn't drink till my senior year. But I stopped being all those things, and I got invited to a party, and I took my first drink. And when I took that first drink, it took, I was an intense kid, it took all that intenseness and just relaxed It was the first time in my life that I did not care what another human being was doing. You know, my idea, I was so intense as student body president, I thought it was my job to run the school. You know, and what I would do is that I would just call a school assembly. I would tell the assembly what was wrong with the school. And then if the school and the principal didn't listen, I would just go across the street to the parish priest. And if he didn't listen, I would follow that up with calls to the school board, to the bishop, and to the superintendent of schools. And I knew they really wanted my ideas in writing, so I would write them follow-up memos on these ideas. You know, that's an intense kid. But when I drank, I didn't care what that school was. I didn't care what my friends were doing. I just felt part of. It was wonderful. Now, I have very few memories of that night. What I know is the next morning I woke up in an outfit different than what I left in. I woke up in some man's big holy jeans, a t-shirt, lost articles of underclothing along the way. I, um, you know, it was the first time I went out drinking, you know, and I blacked out. And years later I was in college and I was reading the 20 questions in a psychology book. And one of the 20 questions was, Do you ever black out? Now, I read that, and my honest answer is, is there any other way to drink? I didn't know any other way to drink. I drank to get out. That's why I drank. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I found out that there were some people who, when they drank, the room would spin. I see some heads nodding. The room would spin. And they wouldn't like that spinning, and they would lie on their bed, and they would put their foot over the bed, onto the floor, and try to stop the room spinning. I see more heads nodding. You're wimps. You know, I thought, I don't think you're a real alcoholic if you did that, because I drank to get the room spinning. And if it wasn't spinning enough, I shook my head and drank some more so it would keep spinning. You know, that's a real alcoholic for you. I want it out. Within a year of that first drink, I was drinking every day. Within four years, I was waking up in places I didn't know how I got there. I woke up with a man I didn't know his first name. Had to look for the driver's license to try to figure that out and had to look out the curtains to see what city I was in. And that was in four years. Now, I realize that I'm an alcoholic more today with seven years of sobriety than I ever did when I was drinking. And I saw, as I got more sober, how my disease progressed. You know, when we're in the middle of our disease, we're not saying, stepping over the magic line. We don't do that. Now I've been into this step, and we just don't do that. But looking back on it, when I first started drinking, it was an awful lot of fun. 
You know, I'd black out. We would laugh. We would party. The people would come by the next day, tell me what I did. We would all laugh because it was funny. And then as time went on, the people would just come by the next day, and they would just tell me who I owed apologies to. And then as time went on, they just came by and said, you were ugly. You're an ugly drunk. And what woman wants to be called ugly? And at the end of my drinking, they just stopped coming by. When I stopped drinking, I still had a full-time job, but I had no one close to me. I had burnt everybody out that was close to me. Now, I did not stop drinking because I thought it was a good idea. You know, I knew that there was a problem with my drinking, but my answer was control. Because I felt if I could control it, then nobody would challenge me on my drinking. Because the worst thing about being challenged about one's drinking is facing the fact that one might have to stop. So I tried the control. I stopped all the drugs and all the marijuana three years before I stopped drinking. I stopped the hard alcohol. I gave up my bourbon one year before I stopped drinking. My last year of drinking was light white wine, which is a wimpish way to go out, but that's how I went out, light white wine. But even in that, when I drank that light white wine, my body couldn't take it anymore, and it would just keep heaving and heaving it up. My body gave out. It could no longer take alcohol. And when I stopped, my head got foggy really quickly. Because when I stopped drinking, I didn't know about AA. I didn't know about treatment centers. I dried out on my bed in a fetal position because my body cramped so badly from the withdrawal. And at night, I'd want to sleep. But who sleeps in their first six months of sobriety? You know, we're learning the difference between sleeping and passing out. No one sleeps their first six months. And so what I would do is just sit by my window and hug my pillow with my knees to my chin and rock back and forth. And it's the worst memory I ever have are those first few days of sobriety. You know, because even though it was killing me, I wanted a drink more than I wanted anything else. And I would have taken that drink if my body would have held it. Finally, I got up enough strength and I went back to work. That doesn't mean I actually worked. <laughs> that means I got to my office, I closed my office door, and I put my head on my desk. But they had some things, some functions that I had to show up to at work. And at that time, I was a Catholic nun. I was a pastoral associate up in that church in Eureka, and I did things like give the sermons on Sunday and help with the Bible school and help with the poor people and do all those churchy things. And I had to show up to a meeting where the social chairperson of the parish was giving us the calendar. So it was the pastor, myself, and this woman. And after she gave us this calendar, she said, I have something else I want to share with you. I'm really happy to do the social events for the church, but I have other gifts. I'm a recovering member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you ever know anybody that needs help, just give me a call. And my jaw dropped because I needed help. And so I called her that afternoon, and I told her I had a friend that needed help. And she came right over. And I told her I was that friend, and she gasped. You know, and I was afraid of that gasp, because by that time I could put the word alcoholic to what I was. And I was ashamed of being a nun and an alcoholic. And she said, Donna, I didn't gasp because you're a nun. You know, nobody is too good or too bad to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, nobody's story here is going to surprise us. She said what she gasped about was that she had never shared with a person outside of AA that she was a recovering alcoholic. She said she went home from that meeting with the pastor and cried all the way home because she felt she had so inappropriately blurted that out. And she said it just shows her how her higher power is working in her life. You know, and I st that woman is still very close to me. And when I tell that story, it still gives me goosebumps. Because I needed help. And boom, that help was there. And it's been my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous that I have never had to go through anything by myself. Now, there have been, honestly, there have been times in my sobriety that I have chosen not to take advantage of the help that's there. 
But that help was always there if I would just reach out my hand. Now, that woman had some suggestions for me. And her first suggestion was that I go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And lo and behold, the meetings were right outside the parish grounds. I could see them from my office window. I just never knew what they did in that building. And I told her that I couldn't go to meetings because that would ruin my reputation. She told me my reputation could handle it, if you can imagine. (laughs) She didn't realize I was a sensitive alcoholic. And I said, I'm not going to meetings. And she said, okay, you don't have to go to meetings. And she said, Donna, I suggest you read the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. We lovingly refer to it as the big book. I said, I don't read the good book, and I'll be damned if I'll read your big book. She said, okay, you don't have to read the big book. And I thought, things are going my way. She said, why don't you come by my house tomorrow afternoon? Now, that I could handle. All that arrogance was just a lot of fear. The going to her house in the afternoon, that wasn't threatening. And that I could do. And I just went to her house, and she told me her story. And I realized really quickly that this woman was really sober. She wasn't lying. And she was comfortable not drinking. She had problems in her life, but she knew how to deal with those problems. And I realized if I ever wanted to stay sober, I was going to have to take her suggestions. And so I started taking her suggestions. And when I went to my first meeting, it was a woman's meeting. And the thing that struck me the most was when they read Chapter 5, and it said the willingness to go to any lengths. And I hoped that I would have the willingness to go to any lengths. I wasn't praying. Who's praying in their first few months of sobriety? I was just hoping that that would come true for me. And when I got sober, I sat in the back of the meetings. I didn't talk to anybody. But as time went on, I got a little more comfortable, and I sat up closer in the meetings and closer. And I still wasn't talking to people, but, you know, I found out that there were some people that I felt more comfortable sitting next to than other people. And I couldn't figure it out because they were all different ages, all different races, and all different kinds of people, and I couldn't figure out what was the same. But eventually somebody told me what was the same. They said, those are the people that work steps. And so I started working steps. In the first step, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives became unmanageable. The step was easy for me. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, alcohol won. There was no fight left in me. It won. I was powerless over alcohol. Unmanageability was not a hard concept for me either. As I told you, my first meeting was a woman's meeting. And these women would say, call us in the morning. And so I would call them, and I would say, what do I do with my life? I had big problems. (laughs) And they had some suggestions. They said, Donna, why don't you get out of bed? Why don't you make your bed? Why don't you go to work and show up on time and give a full day's work for a full day's pay and then go to a meeting? When that is new information, your life's unmanageable. And that was new information, you know. I was a nun for ten years, five of them drinking and using, and five of them clean and sober. And, you know, nuns get $35 a month. Now, that $35 a month covers your clothes, your personal expenses, your eating out, all that stuff. Now, when you're an alcoholic, it doesn't cover one night out. So I pretty much felt that if I even showed up to work, you were lucky, no matter how long it was. Now, my roommate is also in the program. She's up in Santa Monica, and she was a cocaine addict in addition to being an alcoholic. And she said, Donna, I never did cocaine. And she said, Donna, I know why you never did cocaine. What are you going to do? Go to the mother superior and say, hey, I'd like a year's advance. I'm going out tonight. (laughs) not going to (laughs) work. So unmanageability was not a hard idea for me. The second step came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Not a hard step either. I had no problems with the word restore me to sanity or the implications of insanity. I felt it was inappropriate behavior for the circumstances I was in. I told you I was a nun. My idea of showing up to the convent was going to the mother house after a night of partying and a terrible hangover. For those that don't know, a mother house is nuns' headquarters. It's a big brick building 
right out of the movies in Orange County. So I showed up at the mother house in a very short pair of cut-off jeans, a T-shirt, no bra, sandals, a beach hat, a teddy bear in one hand, and a sign in the other hand that said, Mother House or Bust. First night in the convent. They told me they weren't impressed. That's okay. It took me two hours to find the local bar, cute little pub on Chapman. I call all my friends from L.A. and I say, meet me at the bar at 8 o'clock. And the mother superior gets wind of it. And she said, Donna, we don't do that here either. And I said, okay, I'm open. What do you do for fun? And they said, well, we go get a group of nuns together and we go to the third story of the mother house. And they did what they called polite conversation. This alcoholic didn't do polite conversation. So I said, who brings the wine? And she said, Donna, we don't do that here. And I said, that's okay. I brought the wine. So I showed up for my first night of polite conversation with a bottle of wine, a bottle of brandy, and five shot glasses. And I put the five shot glasses on the table in front of those nuns. I filled them with brandy. I lit them on fire and taught the nuns how to drink flaming hookers. <laughs> they told me that they didn't do that there either. <laughs> I was the first nun in that convent caught smoking pot. They told me they didn't do that there. <laughs> And they made me promise that I would never, ever, 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 ever smoke pot again as long as I lived. And in the bottom of my heart, I really felt that I wanted to be a good nun. And so I looked him in the eye, and I meant it with my whole heart, and I said, I promise. And I meant it. But you know, two weeks later came, somebody offered me some pot. And I said, I don't think they meant forever. Can you imagine giving up marijuana forever? I said, I don't think that's what that means. And so I had an awakening about what forever meant. Forever meant do not smoke pot in the convent, but at the beach is okay. Stop turning the other young nuns onto pot. Stop putting pot in the nuns' food. My sponsor pointed out that anybody that thinks forever has three exceptions is insane. That's insane and has no problems with this step. Now, you may say to yourself, sure, Donna, your behavior was inappropriate for a convent. Anybody's behavior is going to be inappropriate for a convent. But my behavior was inappropriate for society at large. You know, I did a lot of drinking and driving, especially up in Eureka. And when you drink and drive in Eureka, the way you die is that you drive over a cliff. That's how alcoholics die in Eureka. But if you happen to get stopped by the police before you drive off the cliff, your name goes in the Times Standard newspaper. And I knew that that eventually would happen to me. So I came up with a contingency plan on how I was going to handle this. I let my driver's license expire for one year. Because I knew when that policeman stopped me, he would ask, why is your license expired rather than why are you drunk? Now, anybody that thinks they're going to get away with that is insane. Nobody's going to get away with that, you know? So it was inappropriate behavior for the circumstances I was in. No problem with step two. You know, anybody that kept drinking the way I drank and expected not to get drunk expected different results. That's insanity. And came a power greater than myself, I didn't have a problem with that. It was my group. You know, that women's group had tremendous ideas. I thought they were geniuses. And they were, you know, I just followed their suggestions, and my life got better really quickly. And so that part was no problem. The hardest step for me was step three. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. That step was not hard for me because I didn't believe in a God. I believed in a God. But I believed that God was very angry at me. Now, I did not grow up with an angry God. I grew up with a very loving God. My parents are very free thinkers when it comes to religion and when it comes to spirituality. So I grew up with a really healthy concept. But I had done enough things over the years that I thought God had had enough. You know, I would give a sermon on Sunday, and you came up to me and said, Sister, I got a lot out of that sermon. My first thought was you were a fool for believing it because it was a scam. I had distanced myself that much from my higher power. 
And I knew that higher power got me sober because I felt God was angry at me and wanted to punish me. And you have to be sober because drunks feel no pain. And I waited a year and a half in that sobriety for that pain to come. But the Myrtletown survivors are very clear in what they think about the steps. They simply say, if you do not work steps, you will not stay sober. Now, I'm a college graduate, and I don't know how to get around that. Can't get around that. And so what do you do? Because by that time, I wanted to be sober more than I wanted anything else. So what I did is I just opened up the big book to the third step prayer. I got on my knees. I said it. And I hoped that one day it would come true. Still wasn't praying, just hoped. And when push came to shove and I really needed a higher power, it was my sponsor and my group was my higher power. And all I did was just keep saying that third step prayer on my knees on a daily basis, hoping that it would come true. And then just relying on the sponsor and the group. And that worked. That gave me the courage to go on and do that inventory. That inventory was the second attempt at being honest. My first attempt at getting honest was just getting a sponsor when I got to this program. Because it was easier for me to lie when I got sober than it was to tell the truth. You know, when I came here, if I was still drinking, and you said, Donna, how did you get here tonight? I'd lie to you. I'd tell you different streets. I'd tell you a different driver. Not because you really cared how I got here. Just because I was so used to lying. And I found out in sobriety it was just a way of keeping you back. And so that's how I, it was just easier to lie. My first attempt was getting the sponsor. I made the commitment to myself that whatever came out of my mouth to that woman would be the truth, no matter what. I reserved the right not to volunteer information. I reserved the right to lie to everybody else. But if it came out of my mouth to that woman, it would be the truth. And you know what happened is that it started getting contagious. I started telling more people the truth. And then finally I started volunteering information. And today I tell the truth a lot more than I ever lie. It is habit forming telling the truth. The second attempt was this inventory. You know, I was scared stiff of the inventory. You know, but I, what I was really scared of was the fifth step. I knew God knew it. I knew I knew it, but I did not want another human being to know it. The way I got through the inventory was that I reserved the right never to do the fifth step. If I don't want to do the fifth step, I'll never do it. My commitment was to be honest with the piece of paper no matter what. And it worked. I was able to get everything on that piece of paper. And I did my inventory kind of just like it says in the big book. You know, I made those funky three columns. And I put who I resented, what they did to me, and what it affected in me. And when I finished those three columns, I went back over it, made a fourth column of my part in it. And then I wrote about my fears. And then I did the sexual inventory. And when I finished that inventory, I was willing to share most of it with the sponsor. So I bopped onto her house to tell her about it. For those of you that don't know, I didn't say this earlier, for people that are really new, a sponsor is just a good friend in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a person that first is hopefully sober. <laughs> Second, you can't assume these things. You've got to be sober and hopefully work steps in your life and can show you the path. So I bopped over to my sponsor's house and I shared everything except three things. One of them was that I was still stealing from the church I was working at. And I knew if I told her who was on the parish council, I'd get fired. So I didn't tell her. But then I went back to my meetings and it seemed like the only topic that the Myrtletown survivors talked about for two weeks straight was that we were as sick as our secrets. And the secrets are going to get us drunk. And I couldn't find a meeting where that topic didn't come up. And every time they said that, I would just get a terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach because I'd remember those things that I held on to. And finally, I got my sponsor on the telephone, and I muffled them through. And she told me years later she had no clue what I was saying because I was incoherent. But that gave me courage to tell her those things face to face later on. And that's when the relief of the fifth step came. It was not a cloud nine high. I did not feel like I was walking hand in hand with the universe. In fact, I felt really raw. And I went to meetings. I wanted to go to meetings, but I didn't want to get hugged. I just wanted you to stay about a foot away from me. 
you know, just for a while because I felt so raw. And that rawness left. But I felt part of. But you know, the biggest bonus for me was that for the first time since I had started drinking, I could look you in the eye. And I, if I really respected you when I was drinking, I didn't look you in the eye. Because I knew if I really respected you, you could tell I was scamming you. And I didn't want you to find that out. And now I could look you in the eye. And that was just a marvelous feeling for me. It was, I didn't have any more secrets. And I loved it. I loved it. My sponsor suggested that we move on with the steps. You know, she said, go on and do your sixth and seventh step. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Now, she said, if you read it in the big book, the big book says, after your fifth step, go home and do it. It does not say, spend three months, talk about it at meetings, and take a vote. It just says, go home and do it. And so I went home, and I spent that hour of quiet time going back over the first five steps and seeing if I had done the best job that I could and seeing if there was anything I had left out. And then I just said the seventh step prayer on my knees and again, hoped, didn't pray, hoped that it would come true. Now, my sponsor suggested that there were things that I needed to do to cooperate with the gift that's given in the sixth and seventh step. She said, Donna, you will hear in this program that God will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. She said, but you will also hear in this program, probably not as often, God will not do for us what we can do for ourselves. She told me that God was not codependent. God would not do that. She said, Donna, the way you're going to stop being a thief is that you're going to stop stealing. And that was new information for me, too. I didn't know how I was going to be a stopping stealing, but she had some ideas. Now, I think these steps made sense to me because of my religious training. I grew up wanting to be a saint by the age of 30. I'm 33. I didn't make it. But I was on course, you know. I, I was doing, I was picketing for all the right causes in high school. I had gone to college. I had taken Save the World majors. I was a psychology, sociology, and theology major. Then I joined the convent and worked with the poor people and, you know, taught Bible school and just did it. My goal in life was to make Mother Teresa look small. I was going to be a humble saint. <laughs> looking good, looking good. But I didn't quite make it. You know, I just kept getting drunk. Just kept getting drunk. So when I came to these steps... And they said, the Myrtletown survivors told me progress, not perfection. You know, that we just do the best we can, let the outcome come to God. It felt like the weight of the world had been lifted from my shoulders. It was the first time in my life I felt that if I just did the footwork, that was enough. If I just did my best, that was enough. Okay? So my sponsor says, Donna, the way you're going to stop being a thief is you're going to stop stealing. And I thought, I wonder how this is going to happen. Eighth and ninth steps. Made a list of all persons we had harmed, became willing to make amends to them all, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. She said, go home and make your list. So I went home, and I made that list. Now, my sponsor, when I got sober, there was nobody dying in my life. There was nobody moving away. So she said, Donna, in that case, you do the steps in order. She said, how can you make amends unless you know what you're making amends for? You don't know what you're making amends for unless you've done the fourth step. Whoever gets the courage to do that fourth step without the first three. So she said, Donna, in, do the steps in order. So I made that list. I went over, and we talked about those people on the list. Probably the most profound thing that I have read about these steps does not come from AA literature. You know, we hear the sizz, the sizz, what is that, the hissing. You know, non-AA literature. It was an article in Newsweek magazine. It was a man. He was about 35 years old. And his father had left the house when this kid was five years old. And when this kid turned 35, the father got sober, bounced back in his life, and said, Sorry for anything I may have done. 
and bounced right back off. And the guy was devastated. And he was angry. And he was hurt. And in the middle of the article it says, I hope he can check this off of his checklist to his AA sponsor. That amends did more harm than it ever did good. And I didn't want that to happen with my amends. And probably the person that had the most wits about her, my sponsor, really didn't want that to happen. <laughs> and she knew there was potential for that. So we went over that list. Now, she put some people back on the list that I hadn't put on the list because she remembered the inventory. She took some people off the list because I was going to apologize for being alive. And she said, Donna, you're a sober woman in Alcoholics Anonymous. You do not need to apologize for being alive. And we went over that. Now, she said, Donna, there are some people on this amends step that you are not going to make amends to. One of those were those nuns that you put that marijuana in their food. She said, you are not going to go back to some 70-year-old nun and tell her that she is imbibed of the evil weed. <laughs> Donna, if you do that, she will have a coronary, and you will have a bigger amends on your hand. So we didn't make those amends. So then we talked about each person, and I went off and did those amends. Now, most of my amends went really well, you know. The most embarrassing amends were the stealing. I paid back every cent that I could ever remember stealing. And it was embarrassing. It's embarrassing to go back to those churches and say, hey, here's your money back. But you know, I don't steal today. Not because I like you. Not because I want you to have what's yours. I hate making amends. I hate it. I hate it. That's why I don't steal. But it works. I'm not a thief today. It works. And so that's how it was. You know, if the motivation isn't there, just do the action. <laughs> hate making amends. Some of my amends, you know, people cried when I made amends to them. Because I was the kind of person that could hurt you in such a way that you felt you had done it. And it was a nice plan. I hurt you. You feel guilty. I go drink. Very nice arrangement. So when I went back to these people and said, hey, it was me, they cried because they could release that guilt that they had been carrying all those years. One such woman was my novice director. A novitiate is a two-year boot camp on how to be a nun. A novice director is that person that tried to teach me how to be a nun. And you can probably guess that her life was difficult. She once told me that I drank more than other nuns. And I looked her in the eye and I said, of course I drink more than other nuns. That's because other nuns don't know how to drink. She said, oh, that's all I ever heard about my drinking in the convent. Because I pretty much believed that the best defense was a good offense. You see anybody coming close to you that's going to challenge you on your drinking and using, you just shove it right back in their face so hard that they never talk to you about it again. And that's what I did. And I did other things to her. And so when I could go back and own my part of it, she just cried. She could release that guilt. Some people pretended things never happened. She said, uh, one of them was the first school principal. My first year in the convent, I taught eighth grade out in Orange County. And that school principal was the nun that lived right across the hall from me in the convent. But, you know, the last week of school of teaching eighth grade when you're in charge of graduation, and it's been a tough year, and all my friends were going on vacation that week, I thought I was entitled. I left. I left my last week of school. And she said, you know, Donna, teachers and nuns just don't leave their last week of school. And I said, well, that's just life. My friends are going on vacation. You know, I started that vacation at 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday morning. And it took me till 7 o'clock that evening just to get to Santa Barbara because I drank my way through L.A. Now, when I went back years later to this school principal and said, you know, that last week of school and my other behavior through that week, I'm really sorry. And this is what was going on. She said, I don't remember anything. Now, it wasn't my job to convince her I had been a schnook or a drunk 
That's her denial system going. And so it's not my job to break that denial system. All it's my job is to own my side of the fence and walk away. If she wants to be in denial, that's her problem. And that's what that taught me. One person, though, when I made amends, told me to go to hell. Told me if there was any pain that could come to me in life, she hoped it came because nobody could hurt me as much as I had hurt her. And I was devastated because somewhere in the back of my head, I thought you made amends and walked off happy into the sunset, and this just wasn't going to be. Just wasn't going to be. And so I went back to my sponsor, and I said, maybe I should try again. And she said, no, Donnie, you really did the best you could. You just pray for her. And so I prayed for her. And what happened was that three years later, this woman called me. She was in another 12-step program, and it wasn't quite working for her. And she called me, and she said, Donna, it's not working for me. I need to work steps. You're a woman that works steps. Will you help me? Sure, I'll help you. We'll start with the amends. I am number one on your list. Now, I did not say that to her because then I'd have to make amends, and I hate making amends. <laughs> what I did was I got her in contact with someone from that 12-step program that could help her. You know, after that happened, we're not good friends today. I realized that I never liked her. I don't like her today, and I'm not going to be her best friend. Because I don't have to be best friends with anybody I don't want to be best friends with. But I do have to love her. I do have to pray for her and pray for everything that's good in life for her. I do have to be able to be in the same room with her and not feel ashamed, guilt, or resentful of her. And let go of the resentment so that she doesn't take up the rent in my head. And you know it worked? Today I don't feel those resentments or that shame. It worked. And I don't have to be, I don't have to spend time with people I don't want to spend time with. And that's what the relief of these steps do for me. It was great. It was a great feeling. The tenth step, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. My sponsor started me out on this step early. She, it was a daily written tenth step for the first year and a half. Today it's daily. It's just not written. And it's looking for the resentments, for the selfishness, for the dishonesty. You know, looking for that fear on a daily basis. And it's looking for the good things on a daily basis. And there's a part when it talks about steps 10 and 11 in the big book that's just equally as important to me. It says, have we kept something to ourselves that we should have shared with another person? And that's important because it's important for me. I kind of visualize my day. I said, have I been moving toward people or have I been moving away from people? Because I can be in an absolutely huge room and still isolate. And if this alcoholic drinks, it's because this alcoholic has been keeping those secrets. And so it's important for me on a daily basis to make sure that I've gotten rid of those secrets. They taught me in Alcoholics Anonymous, especially at that women's meeting, to call another sober woman besides my sponsor on a daily basis and let them know how I'm doing. They said, do not call, get an answering machine and hang up. Do not call and get a busy signal and hang up and do not return a call. It's you getting another sober woman on the phone where you initiate the phone call. And that's been important to me because today I have a, a support group such that I can call and say, hi, this is Donna. And they know how I'm doing before, just by that voice, just by that quick line. They know how I'm doing before I sometimes know how I'm doing. And that's a great place to be. I learned about this step. I learned how it helps me with my anger. I was born an angry person. My mom, when I was a couple years sober, said to me, Donna, you grew up different than the other kids. When you were born, you were born angry. She said, you came out wanting to fight. You came out having a better idea of how life should be, and you didn't care who you shared that better idea with. And that anger followed me through my drinking, and it followed me into sobriety. And when I was about six months sober, someone in Eureka AA and I want to tell you that it was not from the Myrtle Town survivors, broke their anonymity. And they gave a full-page story on the front page and their picture about AA in Eureka. And they said, you can find everybody in AA in Eureka from a Hell's Angel to a nun. Now, while there are 200 Hell's Angels in Eureka, there are 14 nuns. And I was living with all of them. 
And my anonymity was blown, absolutely blown. Everybody knew. But the hard thing was is that the convent that I was living with, the women that I was living with, they all knew that I got sober six months ago. You know, they were doing novenas for me not to drink. They weren't telling me, but they were doing novenas for me not to drink. And what, when I got sober, I told them I was on a diet and that I was working late at night. They found out I was an AA from the front page of a newspaper. So I went to my meetings and I yelled and I screamed. And I said, you had lied to me. You had promised me safety. You had promised me anonymity. And you lied. And my home group listened to that anger and they listened to that rage. And they felt sorry for me. You know, they really felt bad for me. And I thought that I had found righteous anger. But, you know, my sponsor was out of town. And my sponsor came back in town and we had a talk. And I tried that same rage and that same anger out on her. And it lasted all of ten minutes. And at the end of the ten minutes, she said, Donna, we have two choices. The first choice is that we go to every single meeting in Humboldt County. And we talk about the traditions. And we talk about anonymity. And we all need to remember the traditions. She says it will cause lots of controversy. Alcoholics love controversy. And we'll all stay sober another week. She said it will be wonderful. She said, or we can go for choice number two. Now, I know the look in my sponsor's eye when we're going for choice number two. And you probably know the look in your sponsor's eye when we're going for choice number two. And choice number two was we look at why I was so angry. And she said, Donna, you're angry because you haven't lost the shame of being an alcoholic. You haven't lost the shame. She said, you're really angry at yourself because you were too chicken shit to tell those nuns yourself that you were an alcoholic. And when you lose that shame, you'll lose your anger. And you know she was right. When I lost that shame, I lost the anger. And it was an important lesson for me. There is no such thing as righteous anger for this alcoholic. And I just need to keep going for what's underneath it. The 11th step, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Everything that I know about spirituality today has come from Alcoholics Anonymous. That doesn't mean I was not brought up right. I was. It means that Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me a spirituality and taught me how to accept the lessons that I was taught as a kid. You know, the other day, it was about a year ago, something happened and I was in home with my parents in Riverside. And the anger just builds up. And my mother sees the anger rushing from my toes all the way to my head. And she sees me ready to go out and do action in the heat of that anger. And she stops me and she looks me straight in the eye. And she said, Donna, you have worked too hard to give in to your anger. And she stopped me cold. And I thought, if I would have listened to this woman, I would have saved myself a number of years of drinking and using (laughs) or a lot of pain in early sobriety. Those were the lessons of my youth, and they were good lessons. So, but spirituality, you know, I would, my sponsor would say, and my group would say, pray about it. And I would say to my sponsor, I don't know how to pray. And she'd say, Donna, you just gave the sermon on prayer. And I'd say, yeah, but it was a scam. I was lying. And she'd say, oh. (laughs) She wasn't impressed. So she said, Donna, I'll tell you. All you need to know about a God is that there is a God and you're not it. And that that God loves you. When it comes time to pray, all you have to do is be quiet and talk to a God like you would talk to one of us. And meditation All you have to do is be quiet and listen, like you would listen to one of us. And she said, if you look in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, we teach marvelous lessons on how to relate to people. You know, we come into the program, we learn how to shake each other's hands, we learn to talk to people, we learn to be honest about our feelings and to share those feelings. And she said, and you take those same exact lessons and apply it to a higher power, and it's just that easy. And it is that easy. If I keep it that simple, it's that easy. Now, my sponsor suggested that I start my day out with prayer meditation. Now, that was new information, too, 
because when I was a nun, I started my day out to Pink Floyd. For those of you that don't know Pink Floyd, Pink Floyd is a hard rock group. And my favorite era of Pink Floyd was when I was teaching. And you teach, and you live in a convent, and right next door on the same grounds is this Catholic school. And I taught eighth grade. School started at 8 o'clock in the morning. So at 15 to 8, I start out my meditation to Pink Floyd, and my favorite song was One More Brick in the Wall. One of the nuns once heard that song, and she said, Donna, I think you have to be on drugs to understand this. And I said, we're getting closer. (laughs) The words of the song are, we don't want no education. We don't want no thought control. Teacher, leave those kids alone. So you get that blaring. Five after eight, I run out to my classroom, and it is still the only class that's there because everybody else's teacher managed to get there at eight o'clock and take them into the classroom on time. Five after eight, I heard these 48th graders in the room. Already, life is overwhelming. I can't stand it. I run out to the drinking fountain, start popping speed, run back to the classroom. My sponsor said, Donna, anybody that starts their day out like that is not going to have a good life, let alone a good day. (laughs) Cut out the Pink Floyd in the morning. Pink Floyd can no longer be your higher power. It's got to be God. And I said, okay. She said, now, I don't care if you listen to Pink Floyd later on in the day, but it just can't be your higher power. And you know, when I started my day out like that, with God and some prayer and meditation, life went better. And I learned that when days go bad, I just have to start the day over with more prayer and meditation. And the more I can keep that conscious contact going with the higher power, the more relaxed and the more the day seems to flow. Now, looking for God's will was not an easy thing for me either, the other part of that step. She said to me, you know, I said, you know, I came to this program a bargainer. I knew how to bargain with God. You know, that was the basis of our relationship. And really, frankly, I thought that I had a lot of chips in my favor. When you join a convent and give your whole life to God, you feel like you have a lot of bargaining chips and God owes you. And I felt that God owed me. And, she, you know, they say that's not how you do it. You don't ask for things in this program. You just ask for God's will. And that was hard. It was hard to change that motive. The way I got out of that thinking was through an inventory. I simply got out a piece of paper, and I put a line in the middle of it. And on one side of the piece of paper, I wrote out all the things that had ever happened to me in life that I had wanted, grasped at, and bargained for. And I listed them. And on the second column, I listed all the things that had just come to me in life that I hadn't really thought about that much and hadn't bargained for and hadn't grasped at. I found out that that second list was an awful lot better than that first list. And whenever I get that graspy feeling, I just try to remember that list and remember that God does for me better than I could ever do for myself. And I get that graspiness sometimes. And I visualize that list. And sometimes that visualization, it doesn't really, it doesn't do at all. I don't release the graspiness. But what really helps me with that graspiness is talking to God. You know, I reserve the right to tell God my opinion on any topic that comes up. He's, he's entitled to know my opinion just in case he doesn't got it. You know, he might have been busy. God, this is how I feel about the situation. And after I tell God about the situation, if I can just keep talking to God, usually by the end of it, it gets to be, God, I am afraid of this. God, I'm really worried about this. God, this just scares me. And when I can get to that point of telling God what really scares me, that releases the graspiness. And I can pray for God's will in my life because I know I've trusted my God. I've been honest with my God, and I've trusted my God. And when it gets to that fear, it's just easier to release. Easier to release feelings than things. The twelfth step, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to other alcoholics, practice these principles in all of our affairs. My spiritual awakening came at a year and a half sober. I'm not sure it really came then. You know, I think our first spiritual awakening is that we did not drink today. 
that is a spiritual awakening, but I didn't realize that. I realized that I had a God in my life at a year and a half. My group told me that it had probably been happening for months, but I just hadn't realized it. You know, one day I woke up and wanted to live, and I didn't want to live before then. You know, on the way to work at the corner at the stoplight, there was a gun shop, and I would just think about how I was going to get a gun, go to the beach, wrap a towel around my head because I didn't want to be messy, and then shoot my brains out. And that's what happened whenever there was a red light on the way to work. I didn't want to live. My first year and a half of sobriety was painful. But I wanted to live that day. And as time went on, I realized that I could stay sober with the help of God and Alcoholics Anonymous. And before that, I thought that sobriety was for you, but never for me. And I always knew that I was going to go back out drinking. It was just a matter of time. And I realized if I did the footwork, I could really stay sober. It was a gift. And then as time went on, I realized there was a God in my life and that that God loved me. They were very quiet happenings. (coughs) Excuse me. My group said that they had probably been happening for months, but I just hadn't realized it. They said they came because you work steps. Having worked these steps, you'll have a spiritual awakening. It's a promise. You do not have to go to India. Now, the spiritual awakening may not come on your timetable, but it will come if we just let it happen. Working with other alcoholics. When I moved down to Orange County from Eureka, I got a sponsor. I would call this sponsor. I would say, Barbara, what do I do with my life? And she'd say, Donna, before we get into your life, what newcomer are you working with? And I'd say, I'm not working with a newcomer. And she hung up. She hung up. Now, I didn't like newcomers. I didn't like newcomers because they took attention away from me. They took my sponsor's time. I wanted her time. And so the only reason I ever worked with a newcomer was that so that sponsor would even talk to me in the morning. And I wasn't terribly successful at it. The second person I took to meetings committed suicide. And I learned really quickly that we do 12-step work for ourselves, and we let go of those results. You know, I have to give people the dignity to die, the dignity to go back out to drink. So you just do 12-step work. You know, I went to those hospitals and picked those women up and took them to meetings and went to those step houses. And they said, Donna, when you leave a woman's meeting, she said, now women work with women and men work with men. She said, you take the women's numbers and you call them. And I said, well, I have more time. They should call me. She said, you are a snob. She said, you call them a couple times. Ask them how they're doing. Listen to them. Do not open your mouth because you'll screw them up. And just, that's it. If they don't call you back, let them go. And take those commitments at meetings. And that's what helped. When I did those things, life got better, and I didn't have those kind of problems. Practicing these principles in all of our affairs, to me, that means working steps in whatever I do. You know, I don't think we work the steps just once. We just keep working them. All 12 steps on all problems. Good things, bad things, and boring things. I have women that I sponsor that say, Donna, I have this problem, and I work the first three steps on it every day this week. Fine, but there are steps 4 through 12. Let's get going. You know, let's get going. And life's changed a lot for me as a result of these steps. You know, I started a raging alcoholic addict that didn't know what to do with her life. Now I'm a sober woman. I have relationship. You know, I didn't show up for things like Christmas and my family. And now my family comes to see me at an AA meeting. They leave their kids with me. They want me to be part of the family. And that and my relationships have grown. I left the convent. I entered the convent a raging alcoholic addict. There wasn't any reason to stay after I was a sober woman. I didn't need to hide from life anymore. So I left the convent. I went back to school. I moved to LA, went to UCLA. I got a law degree and a master's in business administration. You know, I talked about changing careers, and my sponsor said, Donna, I'm tired of listening to you talk. I don't want to hear it again. Just do it. And so with her support, I went back to school. I've been a lawyer for a year, passed the bar the first time around. You know, and that's a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. After I left the convent, I met a man. And I was dating after I left the convent, but I went back to the dating behavior just like I did when I was drinking. And I met this man in the program, and he was too special to have an affair with. 
and I needed to learn how to date and have a relationship. And it was the women in the program that taught me how to do that, how to have a healthy relationship. And we're getting married. We're getting married December 28th, and it's it's just great. You know, we're we're moving into a family together, and that's exciting because he has his two sons. My mother a couple years ago said, Donna, I hope you never get married or have children because you are a woman that hurts people, and I would hate for you to get too close to hurt people. And today she thinks I have one of the most mature relationships going, and she's very proud of me, and that's just an idea of how things have changed for me. Now, I did not come to this program a 90-day wonder. You know, I didn't get here and get wonderful. Up about my first year of sobriety, I went to my women's meeting. I stood up to share and I yelled. I said, AA sucks. You lied. You told me it'd get better, and it didn't, and I hate you all. And just screamed this at the top of my lungs coming up on my first year birthday. And the women came up to me, and they said, we love you. Keep coming back. And will you lead the next meeting? Then I went to my other meeting, my morning meeting, 7.30 in the morning. I said, my sharing was, I hate you all. And if you notice, I'm always late for this meeting, 10 minutes late. And the reason why I'm always late for this meeting is when I get up in the morning, I have to spend time thinking about whether I even want to spend time with you. And they came and they hugged me, told me they loved me, asked me to lead the next meeting. That's a year. I started sponsoring people at a year and a half of sobriety. This poor woman asked me to sponsor her, and my sponsor was out of town. I didn't know what to do, so I took her out to the bars dancing. Not impressed. When my sponsor came back, she said, Donna, if you hang out the bars, that's your business, but you do not take newcomers with you. Now, that is not a quick start in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> but, you know, even with all the mistakes... I think the thing that saved me was just keep talking about it and just keep taking direction. And sure, I made mistakes, but if you keep taking direction, you know, and you keep open about it, things get better. I'll share one last thing with you. Probably the most profound thing I have heard about steps comes from a woman I sponsor. She was six months sober when she said it. We were sitting in my living room talking about the six and seven steps. And she says, Donna, I've got it. And I thought, oh, tell me. She said, I understand the steps. She said, the steps aren't quaaludes. I thought, we are in so much trouble. Please, my ego got into it. And I thought to myself, please do not tell anybody in Los Angeles I am your sponsor. (laughs) But I listened to her. And you know she was right. She was absolutely right. We drank and we used and we got that instant result. And we got that quick fix. And we got used to that quick fix. But you know, as time went on, that drink and that drug kicked us in the butt. It turned on us, each and every one of us. Now we come to Alcoholics Anonymous and they say work a step. So we go work the step and we want the quick fix. We want to feel good now because that's what we're used to. And it doesn't happen like that. Steps take lots of time. They take lots of practice so that they become habit and ingrained in our life. And that takes lots of time. But, you know, the steps will last for us, whereas that drink and that fix didn't last for us. And it's really profound, you know. So now I steal it from her, but I try to give her credit. (laughs) I want to really thank you. You know, if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, I hope you found here what I have found. I have found a wonderful way of life. People that I've met here that are the most fabulous people I've ever met, that just rank right up there, that are profound in their wisdom. And I hope you find that, because I don't want to trade it for anything. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.